You're listening to Behind the Wheels with Doug Mason, Dave Walters, and Mike Yeagley. This is a show where we talk about heavy truck and medium-duty axolands. Doug, Dave, and Mike bring close to 100 years of experience and expertise in the transportation business. Join us once a month to learn new things about axolands. Sponsored by Alcoa Wheels, the global leader in aluminum wheel innovation. Welcome to another episode of Behind the Wheels. I'm Mike Yeagley. I'm Doug Mason. And I'm Dave Walters. Now that we have some understanding of you know what's happening with the vehicle, what's happening with the wheel, let's talk about the things that affect loading. And Dave, I want to start off with the spread axle. You know, let's let's start off there and let's get into that with a little bit more detail. The trailer flatbed market, especially, they are on some reefers, uh, spread axles, but mostly flatbeds, some reefers. And you can understand if you're hauling halves of beefs or something like that why you would have them in reefer sometimes but you know on flatbed say you're picking up a coil of steel you have to make sure that your load limits on each axle so if you set that coil too far back or too far forward you're going to get a different loading so a spread axle was designed to help these guys and it's really designed to do a couple of things the first is we can move this up or back to scale this out correctly. So that's very important. Spread axles in the flatbed market, if you're hauling different size loads every time, whatever you're picking up, you've got to understand that you got to scale these out. So that's really important to have spread axles on it if you're not a dedicated you know, spread axle fleet. Yeah, that's one of the things you brought up. Uh, you know, there there are some of those spread axle fleets out there who are sh- shipping the same things over and over again, and they know where to place them. They know where to put the, the axles. They know where, you know, the, it's a machine there, but that's very rare to have a fleet that has that kind of customers, that kind of customer base. Typically, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the split, spread axle guys, the flatbed guys are really having to do those calculations practically every time they load up. Isn't that right? A lot of them, yes. The big fleets, they basically have computer simulators saying if you put this weight of coil steel on this part, this is where it's all going to, you know what I mean? They they really know that. And But a lot of times, you know, it's hit and miss with some of these guys. They don't have that background. And, and, and you got to understand that, that you can move a whole set of axles, like on some trailers, the the, the tandems, you can slide them forward, backwards. Spread axles, you can take the one, move it up, move it back. And, uh, you know, it, it's just trying to get the load right because yeah. they are going to run portable scales on you. They're going to weigh each axle. It's not the total weight of the vehicle. Now they, they run a lot of portables, so they're going to weigh certain axles, and you better be within limits. Another area that we've seen effect of unloading was the fifth axle, I mean, the, the fifth wheel position. Doug, you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, a little bit on that, sure. Yeah, the fifth wheel positioning, and Dave, you can corroborate this, but typically that that's really not touched much. It's set up and it is where it is, but it can be used to um, affect the loading primarily between the steer and the drives. And so if you obviously move the fifth wheel forward, you're gonna be placing more weight on your steer axle. And obviously you push it back more on your on your drives. And there may be instances where that's, that's needed based on what's being hauled. Uh, you could move a little bit of that weight to the steer axle. As you were saying, Dave, maybe they've got a, a 20,000 pound up there. They're running uh, 10,000 pound wheels or an 18,000 with 9,000 uh, pound wheels. And what they're running in their truck is not, uh, it needs to be distributed forward so that they can balance out each of the axles all the way through. So it's important to understand that because we have had some fleets not really understanding that where they've moved it forward because they wanted to reduce the distance between the trailer and the uh, and the tractor from an aerodynamic perspective and did not understand that that was impacting their loading on their steer axle and actually putting them over. I mean, they've only got a, a 12,000 uh, or a 14,000 pound steer and they moved it forward enough to create an issue. So I don't know, Dave, if you've seen that as well, but that would be the, the concern there is to really understand that just moving that, you know, a, a slot or two can make a difference of you know, 400 plus pounds moving forward or more. 
what I would always say is back when you had the 12,000 pound axles, that affected that a lot more by shifting that ahead. And, you know, before the show, we kind of discussed car carriers. And I would always say car carriers can get some weight on the front steer axles because if they're hauling X amount of cars and they put one of the, the big cars or the big SUVs up front, you know, they can they can get weight on the steer axles. So, I mean, those are all things that really go into this. And you know, we actually had in the car carrier industry where they we had to upgrade them into a stronger wheel because they're a lot different than most carrying loads on the steer axles, where most people really find it hard getting weight up there. And they're one of the few that can. Uh, yeah. I think of fire trucks, actually, they're running 20,000, 22,000 pound front axles because you know, they're carrying X amount of water. They put all their personnel in a cab and it's all on the steer. You know what I mean? So the configuration of trucks are different. That's something, this fifth wheel positioning issue I've seen predominantly on cab overs. Once you go to a cab over design, you're, you know, that steer axle is practically hugging the fifth wheel. I mean, it's, there's not a whole lot of room between them. Where in North America, typically we don't have cab overs and there's a lot of room. And so you, you don't see the same effect, but once you go to the cab over design, that fifth wheel, you really have to be careful about where you place that fifth wheel, because once you go too far forward, that's going to just overload that steer axle. And then the steer axle also, it's got to deal with all the lateral loading. All, you know, when you steer, when you actually go through a turn, that those side loads, that steer axle is going to get beat up pretty hard if you have a cab over design and you have your fifth wheel too far forward. At least that's, that's what I've seen. I, I don't know if anybody else has any comments on that one. Yeah, I mean, in Europe, cab overs are, are dominant. And yeah. when you look at European trucks and the loading is so much different, so they're basically having to run a lot of times a nine inch on the steers just to carry the load. It's a different animal. So, I mean, when you go into, I'm thinking like my experience of, uh, you know, watching triaxle cool trucks go up and down through my town where I used to live. And they would have to pick up their lift axle to make the corners. And all of a sudden you pick up the lift axle to turn. Here you're loaded to maximum every time or a lot of times a little over in my years. The weight that the steer axles had to carry was just ungodly. Here you're turning, you're picking up an axle, putting, transferring that load and making a turn. You know, so you're like, wow, okay. But if you got them on the right wheel, that's where wide base really became prevalent. And then they had no trouble whatsoever. Like I said, there's a lot of applications. And when you start getting your lift axles and your trocked axles and all these other different axles that can transfer load from one to the other, and you can pick that up. And then when they engineer these products, they take an account that that's the load, not when we pick up. X amount and transfer it to someplace else. So a lot of difference when you get into what I would say lift axles and, and trailing axles you can pick up. So, you know, mostly in the vocation industries, you see those a lot. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, probably the most common problem we see, and Dave, I'd like you to talk a little about, about this, is inflation pressure, managing inflation pressure and how not having control of your inflation pressure and what that does to loading. What do you see out in the field when it comes to inflation pressure, especially in uh, dual applications? You know, I do a lot of tech talk with TMC and that. And, you know, it's really funny because wheel guys talk to work and then tire guys talk inflation. Number one issue. So inflation is so critical. Every tire company has charts that they tell you what inflation pressure you should be running with the load that's on that tire. You shouldn't say, well, I run 100 PSI. Well, no, you should actually calculate your load and then go down the chart to say, well, maybe I should be running 115 with the loads I'm running. So there's actually charts that they put out to tell you what inflation you should run to get the maximum tire life. That's a critical, critical thing tire wear with not running the, the right inflation because if you're overloading that tire, your wear is going to definitely be different. So that's why they put out these charts. 
one of the things we see all the time is uh, customers not having control of their inflation pressure for whatever reason, and maybe letting that inner duel get a little bit low, but inflating, you know, having good inflation on the outer duel. And what that does is it transfers the load from the, you know, instead of having the load shared equally between the inner duel and the outer duel, the load's going to be mostly carried by the outer duel. That can have a huge impact on overloading a wheel, can it, Dave? Absolutely. And, you know, in the market now, most of the trailers I see, they run an active inflation system. So basically, they use the air system off the tractor to you know, run it to the wheels to keep them inflated. So when you use an active inflation system, which most people are in the industry now, because, again, inflation is so critical, um, you see that. But unfortunately, the systems are really not adaptable yet to the tractor, and that's very critical to to still maintain air pressure on those. So now there are tire monitoring systems that can tell you, hey, you got a low tire. So, I mean, there's so many advances to tell you or warn you, hey, you got a low tire, you need to check this. Because, you know, I always say fuel is your largest cost, tires is your second largest cost in maintenance. And do you want to get maximum tire wear or not? You know, every 30 seconds you're paying because you're underinflated or or whatnot have you that's why pressure monitoring systems have really started to spark the interest right and to just give some maybe some perspective on this too is if you have like a 15 psi difference you're going to shift about 500 pounds from the inner to the to the outer dual but as that increases let's say you get up to 30 psi which can happen you're talking 1500 pounds or more and it's an exponential situation. So that's why what you're saying, Dave, it's so critical to keep those pressures similar because every PSI you change, it exponentially shifts that load. And we've seen that issue in our warranty. Uh, when we uh, take a look at different fleets and things that are going on, when there's a lot of load on that outer dual, we'll start seeing failure modes consistent with an inner dual not being inflated properly. So not only is it tire life, but it also gets into uh, the wheel life as well by not taking care of it. You know, one area that uh, a lot of people don't think about is loading and unloading strategies. And honestly, I think the part of the reason they don't think about it is because it's really hard to fix. You know, that's one of these things that when you're loading and unloading, it's hard to rebalance your load. You know, it's just not something that's it would take a lot of time, but that does affect overloading. And I don't know, I'll leave it open to either one of you to, to talk about that. Well, just as a, I'm sure Dave's got some other examples as well, but just one example in particular, uh, again, going to, to Europe and they do a lot of side loading in Europe because of the, uh, obviously the area constraints they have. And in these side loaded trucks, the way you load and unload can have a big impact on the overloading, whether you start taking them out of the in this particular instance, this was a, a fleet that was having issues, we're having cracks on and in their wheels. And we come to find out uh, they're carrying uh, large liquid containers, we'll call them. And the way that they were loading and unloading them was creating a significant amount of a load transfer. As they were unloading, they were creating a high load condition on one set of the axles. And so in discussing with them the situation, they learned how to unload it in the proper fashion whereby they did not overload the axles. So in that particular case, it was quite interesting because they're unloading from the side. As you noted, uh, Mike, on a, on a regular dry van that we have here, you got to go in the back and go out the back. Uh, these guys could unload in any way they wanted as long as they had set it up properly. So that was kind of an interesting incidence that I had seen. Yeah, the one I, I always think about is in Japan, there was uh, some customers who were uh, loading and unloading fish that was packed in ice. And as they, you know, they had these pallets, you know, many pallets of fish packed in ice. And as they took them out, the center of gravity for the load was moving further and further and further forward. So when they were fully loaded, there was sort of a weird situation. When they were completely fully loaded, the axles were fine. 
none of the axles were overloaded. They had actually two steer axles on this thing. They had the, the first steer axle, and then right at the, sort of right at the, I'm going to say right at the front of the trailer, it was a rigid a rigid body, right at the front of the, 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 the box, they had a, a second axle, and both of them had the steer capability. So they both were single single tire applications. And so as they unloaded from the back, the load from all those water, that ice packed fish, the center of gravity was moving further and further forward and more and more that load was being taken by that second steer axle. And so practically the whole load was just being carried by that second steer axle that was right there at the front of the box. And they started breaking those things. They started breaking the wheels right at that, uh, at that second steer axle. It was a, an unusual situation, and we were looking at it, and they were they were swearing up and down, you know, we're not overloading, we're not overloading, and you know, we had to bring out a portable scale and show them that the way they were unloading their product was causing an overload situation on that second steer axle. I don't know if that's something that we would see a whole lot here in the U.S. because of the way our vehicles are designed, but it is something to keep in mind, like you brought up, Doug the side loading, and there are all sorts of unusual loading strategies that are out there. This is not a real common one that causes a problem, but it's something that if, you, if you're seeing a problem, it might be something to keep in mind. You know, how are you loading this thing? How are you unloading it? And are you creating a, an overload condition just because of the way, it, uh, the, the way you're, you're handling your load? The thing that I will add in America here's the American ingenuity. If they're going to overload a vehicle, and this could be in packaging, delivery service, or LTL or whatever, their theory is, okay, the bulk of that, that load that we're loading will empty that very first customer, then we'll be all right. So they take a calculated risk of running overloaded to the customer that has the bulk of the load on there, they get rid of that, and they feel really good about it. <laughs> That's smart. You know, like, hey, let's, let's get rid of the heaviest load first, and then we're okay. And what and that also they, does, uh, I was just going to yeah. say, what that also does is it puts the heaviest load right at the back of the trailer. And so, you yeah. know, it's right over those, right over the dualies, you know, and so it's got plenty of load carrying capacity right there. So that's that's yeah. real smart. That's the common practice. Every time that I'd go out to a fleet, you know, and again, I guess my years of getting to know these guys really well, the one time I said something about, you know, you're a big customer, there's no way you could overload. And he's like, sometimes maybe five miles. And I said, what do you mean? Well, if we got too much of a truck, we just throw all the big stuff on the back and get rid of it first. That gets back into our static and dynamic loading because, you know, the, right, yeah. the problem is it's overloading, but it's overloading at a distance. And so if you keep that distance short, then I'm not advocating overloading, <laughs> but, but if you want to minimize the damage, you just get that load off of the vehicle as quickly as possible. Well, great discussion, guys. I think that does it. For our listeners, remember, you can always subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts. And please, if you like what you hear, uh, share it on social media. To submit, if you have any questions or comments, if you want to take a look at the episode transcripts, uh, you can visit our website, elcowheels.com slash podcast. Really want to thank you all for listening. We'll see you next time. Sponsored by Alcoa Wheels, the global leader in aluminum wheel innovation, manufacturing, and technology. Inventing the first forged aluminum wheel in 1948, its team of experts continue to develop the most lightweight, efficient, and high-performing commercial vehicle aluminum wheel products. Bringing you revolutionary innovations like Alcoa Durabright wheels, Alcoa Durablack wheels, the new Alcoa wheels hubboard technology, and the lightest truck wheel on the market, Alcoa Ultra One 22 and a half by eight and a quarter wheel. Alcoa Wheels, the global leader in aluminum wheel innovation.